Hey, I want to let you know about a really great way to connect with Parkway Church. It's called 101. It's a three-week course that we offer uh, for newcomers coming to Parkway Church. If you are checking us out, if you're interested in more information about what we're all about, uh, if you want to have a chance to talk to me and ask some questions uh, about our church, about how it came to be, ask some questions, uh, theological questions even, if you're connecting to our church, questions about God, about faith, about Jesus, we want you to take 101. Uh, it's offered through the year, and uh, basically in three weeks, we talk about uniting with God, what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, how that begins uh, scripturally, and to share some truth with you about that. In the second week, we talk about uniting with church. People have lots of different ideas about what church is. We drive by churches a lot in Western culture, uh, but church is a whole lot more than a building. It's a group of people. And uh, we want to talk to you about the nature of church. We want to be a church that is Jesus' church, that is the church that uh, tries its best uh, to be the kind of church that Jesus wanted us to be. We want to tell you the nature of, of, of what being part of a church is. And in the third week, we talk about what it means to unite with Parkway Church. God has given us a really special uh, vision and, and uh, a goal as we planted a church in the Loyalist Parkway, uh, a vision, a mission for the community that we want to share with you. Uh, as, so you can kind of line yourself up with it and find a place within our church to connect, to serve, to grow. Check out 101. If you're interested in uh, being part of something like that, uh, it's COVID season. There are people connecting to our church who I've never met in person yet. You found us online. We would love to tell you more about it. It happens over Zoom right now during COVID. Uh, but contact our office, 613-378-2953 or myparkwaychurch at gmail.com. We'd love to connect you to 101 and I'll get a chance to meet you as well. God bless you. You know, I find uh, churches and gyms are a lot the same. Uh, you get, they're a big building in the community and you get a whole lot of different kinds of people coming out. And uh, some people come a lot. Some people come to the gym all the time, like almost every day. And uh, there are other people that they might just come to the gym once in a while. Some people have gym memberships, but they never really use them. Uh, they're just they're just kind of on the on the roll. They're a member of the gym and they've paid some dues, but that's about it. And uh, and so people come to the gyms for all different kinds of reasons, just like they just like you go to church. And so uh, when I'm here at the gym, sometimes like I see really, really big guys that uh, they're really, really into pumping iron and they have uh, like cert just certain parts of their body are really, really overdeveloped. And then I see the other people that are kind of hardly breaking a sweat. They're just kind of here at the gym and it's almost like, it's almost like a social time for them. And uh, they're, they're not really concerned that much with the exercise part of the gym. They're just, they just want to come and hang out and talk to people and do all of those kinds of things. And so uh, there's a real close spirit, spiritual kind of like parallel, I think, between, between what we do we, we come to the gym to get our bodies healthy and we come to church to get our, our spirits and our souls healthy. And so I want to talk about spiritual growth today, but I want to talk about it. Just come on in here to the, to the weight room. I want to, I want to talk about it uh, just in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, developing like our spiritual growth and developing an anti-fragile kind of faith. Are certain things that are um, certain things are, are like fragile like this is this is an old it's uh, we, we have some old projectors laying around uh, Kingswood where I teach and this is like an old projector bulb and these things are very very fragile these things are uh, like if you drop them this is like it's all, I can already see that it's broken in the inside. Sometimes you, if you even like look at these or breathe, they seem to, right? We, we don't, the projector is like, 
it's out of date now, so we don't we didn't really need that that bulb. Then there are other things like um, like if you take if you take weights, like you can you can pretty much do whatever you want to these. They're, uh, so if if the bulb is fragile, this is like this is like really really robust. Like nothing nothing is gonna like really hurt that. But it's not going to change at all. It's not going to get any bigger or any better or any stronger or anything like that. Um, then we've got like, uh, like in our body we have we have muscles, and uh, I don't have really big developed muscles because I'm just here at the gym trying to get healthy, trying to stave off old age. And uh, and so there are some guys in here who are like really big, but I just try to like keep moving and and keep in shape. And so if you uh, if you take what you do with a muscle is, a, is you you put you put a strain on it, you put resistance on it, and and what actually happens is as as you put strain and resistance uh, and pressure on this, it this is something that uh, it, it actually gets bigger and it gets stronger and it gets better because of what comes against it, and I find it's true in our life of faith as well, that uh, we want to develop like not just, not a fragile faith and not like just a robust faith, but we want to develop an anti-fragile kind of faith where our faith gets better because of, uh, because of the trials and the struggles and the, the things that come against us. And that's one part of spiritual growth that uh, that we don't talk ab about a lot. I think we've been we've been making a lot of things in our society, and even in the church, we've been kind of making them uh, kind of fragile. If you think of if you think of our children, you think about the concept of of uh, preparing like instead of preparing the child for the road ahead, we prepare the road. We make everything easy, and the problem with making everything easy. As, is that you don't really learn from that and you don't really grow. And I find in the church we've been doing the same things. We've been trying to make, we've been trying to make a spiritual growth as easy as possible. And we try to create these perfect atmospheres where, uh, where we think that faith is going to uh, grow the strongest. Uh, the, the problem with that is that is that we don't need a greenhouse kind of faith. Like a greenhouse is a place that you set up and it's all perfect. Uh, and, and things grow in there, but they'll only grow if they're in the greenhouse. As soon as you take them outside of the greenhouse, uh, they, they, they won't be able to survive because they're only used to a greenhouse uh, kind of effect. And, and we do that in the church sometime, I think. And so, so we need, uh, the problem is that, is that biblically and, and practically, we need a strong, anti-fragile uh, kind of faith. There's a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, and in it, uh, sociologist Jonathan Haidt says, many university students are learning to think in distorted ways, and this increases their likelihood of becoming fragile, anxious, and easily hurt. And, uh, and I've, I have observed that to be true, and I think that the same can be true of, of adults and, and kind of everybody, and it can be true in the church as well as outside of the church. Uh, there was there was a a really interesting experiment that happened in uh, I I think it started in 1987 in a place called Oracle Arizona and I think the project was actually completed in 1991 but it was it was set up by a group of scientists who wanted to uh, they wanted to create this totally enclosed environment where they could control everything just to test and see what would grow and what wouldn't grow and, and just to do, run all kinds of experiments. And what they found was they, they, they had trees in there and they found that the trees grew way faster inside Biosphere 2, uh, but they would get to a, a certain, they wouldn't get to a full growth, they would get to a certain place and then the trees would fall over. And so they were like, what is going on here? Why are these trees falling over before they get to their full growth? And, uh, and what they found was the, the roots were not going deep and the trees were falling over because there was no wind in Biosphere 2. The, the wind that usually comes against a tree, that kind of resistance, the same kind of resistance you get when you're like lifting weights, actually makes trees stronger. 
And, and the, the actual term for what develops on the outside of the tree is called stress bark. And, and without the wind, trees don't develop stress bark, and their roots don't go down deep. And, and so they, they, as soon as, uh, as, soon as it, things get too heavy, they just kind of fall over. They, they collapse. And so we don't want a faith like that. We don't want a greenhouse like biosphere two kind of faith. We want to develop in our spiritual lives. We want to develop some stress bark. We want to let our roots go deep so that we can grow taller. We can grow into like full maturity and we can stand against all the different winds and uh, the things that are going to come against us out in the real world. And so I've got some uh, anti-fragile uh, scriptures to in to encourage you with today. This is uh, this is Romans this is Romans five three. It says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our faith. So I don't know what you are going through in your life right now. I don't know what this past year has has been like for you, but for most people. Uh, there has been an, there has, it has been tough and there's been an element of stress to that. And, uh, and mental health issues are, are like way up. And, uh, and people are, we see, we see trees falling all around us. We see people that are, are just not making it. But the, but the Bible says, it says in Romans that actually times of great stress and struggle and resistance, those can be the times when we, when we grow the most in, in our faith. I don't know what you're facing. I'm facing kind of a David and Goliath kind of situation in my own life right now where, uh, where uh, there's a lot of things that, unusual kind of things. I don't need to go into details, but, but just some circumstances that have come against uh, me and my life and, uh, and my family. And, and so it's been, kind of, it's been kind of a tough time, but those times are actually opportunities for growth. We can either uh, kind of get bitter when those times happen or we can get better when those times happen. And uh, I am determined to, to get better in, in the situation that I'm facing. Another scripture is uh, James 1-2. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when endurance is fully developed, you will be mature and complete, needing nothing. And isn't that what we're aiming for as Christians? We're aiming to be mature in Christ and to be complete. And, uh, and all of the ordinary things that we usually do to grow, like going to church is pretty important, reading our Bible is pretty important, praying and having a relationship with God is, is pretty important. But I, I find for me, like sometimes in the gym, you just... You just plateau. Sometimes in the gym, you just kind of hit this uh, this flat spot where you're not getting any better, you're not getting any worse. Uh, and it, I feel it's the same in our spiritual lives. And one of the things that gets us past that plateau is is just developing developing our endurance. So we want to be trees that can stand. We want to be what the Bible calls like strong oaks. I was driving into Washington D.C. one time. It was like a Saturday morning. The night before was like a really, really bad rainstorm. And as I was driving into the city, there were, uh, there were trees all over the place. Uh, some of them were standing really tall. And, and then a tree right beside it would be, would be blown over and laying on the ground. And, and so I stopped and I wanted to know, like, these trees look exactly the same to me. What's the difference between the two trees? And the trees that were lying down were, were hollow inside. They had a, they, they weren't fully developed. They were hollow inside and they had a really shallow root system. And the other trees that stood against the wind and against the storm were, uh, were trees that, uh, that were solid and they had their roots down deep. And so that's what God uses hard times in our life to do, to kind of take us deeper and to develop that stress bark that we're going to need to, to face life's challenges. Another scripture is 1 Peter 1.7. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have had to endure many trials for a little while. You know, like things like uh, the church opens, the church closes, the church opens, the church closes. 
because COVID comes and goes and, you know, all, all of those kinds of things. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. So this verse talks about joy. And I, I, what I've found in my life is joy is, it's not just about shallow happiness. Joy happens when, uh, when we put Jesus first and then we put others second and then you put yourself third. When we can do that, there's something about that pattern that develops joy in us. And, uh, and it, the verse also talks about being tested and purified by, by fire. There's a, there's a show. Uh, over this past year, I've, I've watched kind of more Netflix than I probably should have uh, because there wasn't a lot else to do at times. And, and so I found myself exploring TV shows that I might not otherwise uh, give a second look to. One of them was a glass blowing show called Blown Away. And, uh, and it was just about, it was like a contest with all these glass blowers and they're like, they're, they're like, they're using these big long tubes and they're blowing glass. And, and, uh, and, and one of the things that I noticed was, was that like they had to, they had to like put the glass, to, to get the glass strong, they, they had to like put it in a fire, take it out of a fire, put it in a fire, take it out of fire, like do, put it in water, do all these different things to it to kind of develop its strength. And I, and I think that's what God does to us when he lets us go through the different circumstances of, of life. It says in, uh, in 1 Peter 4.13, Dear friends, don't be surprised by the fiery trials that you're going through as if something strange was happening to you. Instead, be glad for these trials because it makes you a partner with Christ in his suffering. Everybody wants to be a partner with Christ in his power. Everybody wants to be a partner in Christ when he's feeding the 5,000. Not too many of us think about the aspect of, of our faith where we're a partner with Christ on the cross. But the Bible tells us to take up our cross and, uh, and, and suffering and trials are all part of, of being a Christian. And uh, that fire, uh, that, the, that glass that's blown has to be put in and out of the fire many times and, and, and dunked in the cold water and, and tempered in order, in order to become strong. And so, so the good news is that the Bible says the truth will set you free. If you look at the life of Jesus, you also realize that uh, the truth can also get you arrested and put in jail too. So, so there's, there's the power part of it, but there's also the suffering part of it. And we want to be, we want to be partners with Jesus in, uh, in, in, in everything that he has for us. So the truth is this. The truth is that we are more than conquerors in Christ. No matter what we're going through, no matter what kind of a, a, you know, a, a winter this you've just come through, uh, we are more than conquerors in Christ. The actual word there in Romans, when it talks about us being more than conquerors, is the word Nike. It, it's literally the same word as the, as the Greek goddess of the Olympics, Nike. And Nike is a, like a really big company. You just see the swoosh and you know that it's Nike. And we are part of the church. The church is uh, that when you see a cross on a building, you, you know that's all about Jesus. And uh, we may think sometimes of the church as small and weak, but, but the church is all over the world. And uh, the church is one of the most diverse and uh, kind of multifaceted and, and generous. And like the church does more good in the world than any other single organization. And, uh, and so no matter what we're going through, we are more, we are more than conquerors through Christ. We're, not, uh, we're victors. We're not victims. Our struggle, uh, our struggle can make us stronger. Uh, rather than weaker. It can make us stronger and more adaptable. And what I've found is like when I'm going through hard times, I always have that choice. Am I going to blame God or claim God in the middle of this? When, I, when the harsh realities of life hit me uh, and I have to make that choice, like, am I going to church today? Am I going to the gym today? Or am I just going to sit with my bag of Doritos and kind of drown in my misery? Like, am I going to church today? Am I going to like, worship God anyway, or am I going to, am I going to lay about and, and do something else? And, uh, we either blame God or, or claim God. Uh, I met a guy a couple years ago in, in prison 
Uh, I won't use his real name because we're not allowed to do that, but we'll just call him Jailhouse Joe. Joe walked into, uh, we do a chapel service, at least we did before COVID, we do a chapel service on Tuesday nights once a month. Joe walked into the chapel service. Uh, Joe had uh, like tattoos everywhere. He had two, uh, two teardrops tattooed on his face, which I think means that he has killed a couple people. And uh, uh, we found out later that he, that he was part of a motorcycle gang and, and that it, he, was, he was in jail for being, doing really bad stuff. One of my students saw him. He'd never been to chapel before. They saw him coming in to the chapel and they started praying like, oh God, like don't let that guy sit next to me. He's so scary looking. And, and of course, Joe came right over and sit next to that. So, and they actually became good friends. But Joe started coming to chapel just when we were there, just when the Kingswood team would go there. And uh, one Tuesday night I was there and Joe says, hey, I just became a Christian. Can I share my testimony? And I'm like, yeah, Joe. And I hand him the mic before we're about to do music. He dropped the F-bomb like 10 times in four minutes giving his testimony. And he didn't even know that that probably wasn't a good thing to do in church. He was really, really rough. But then every, every month as we go back on a Tuesday night, Joe would tell me these incredible stories. He went from somebody that all the prisoners feared to somebody that became a confidant, somebody that they would go to with their problems. Joe, at the beginning of it, he was like very feared and very tough. And he started Bible studies and everybody was afraid not to go. And so all these Bible studies happened all over the prison just because they were afraid to say no to Joe. But eventually they realized that Joe had really changed. And, uh, and he just told, every time I went, he would tell me these incredible stories. He reinterpreted all his tattoos. He had ACMD tattooed on his knuckles, which used to mean all cops must die. And now he said it means all Christians must disciple. He had, uh, he had FTW tattooed on his chin, which used to mean like the world. And he, now he, now he said like it means faith the word. And, uh, he actually had, these, these guys got transferred uh, into the prison that were part of the motorcycle gang and they, they cornered them in the, in the prison yard and they, and they said, there's a contract out on you because we've, we've heard that you've turned your back like on the, on the gang. And, uh, he, and they said, we know you're packing a knife because you always carry a shiv. You always carry a knife, Joe. He, he reached in his boot and he pulled out a New Testament and he said, this is, this is the only shiv that I carry now. And, and you can't, you can't take me out. You can't do anything to me, like, on, on, unless Jesus lets you. And they just get so weirded out that they left him alone. And so every, every month I would hear these incredible stories of how Joe was growing. And he, he told me he almost felt like God was turning him into a pastor, like, inside of the prison. And that he would sit in his prison cell and study the Bible, and that that was his Bible college. Then COVID hit, and I was I was like, man, I wonder what's going to happen to all those guys in the prison. They don't, we we like it's been a year, been over a year, like almost like a year and a couple of months since I've been able to get into prison. And I was wondering like, what's going on with all those guys in there? What's going on with Joe? And uh, and then then I got this letter. It's a it's a letter from the prison, a letter from Joe that he sent out through one of the chaplains. And uh, he basically just said like, hey, I want you guys to know what a difference that you've made in my life. And I want you to know that I'm still following Jesus, so, uh, still serving God. And God is using me to, to uh, like reach, to continue to minister to and reach the other prisoners uh, that are all around me. And so uh, when, I, when I heard that, I was just like so happy. And when I first met Joe, I kind of... Uh, I, I just thought like, if God can save Joe, like God can save anybody. And then as I began, uh, just kind of keep, keep, I kept on working with Joe and I saw the way that God was using him, like it kind of went even further than that. And I realized that, I realized that, uh, you know, like if Joe can, if Joe can serve God in that environment, uh, in prison with, with all the, the hardships and everything that's around him and all the pressure that's around him, that like we have no excuse uh, about about like not being able to grow as Christians and and serve God uh, wherever wherever we are. And so, uh, I'll I'll kind of wrap up uh, with this. Maybe 
maybe uh, maybe church isn't just somewhere we go. Maybe it's kind of more like the gym here. Maybe it's a place that we go and we train and we grow in our faith so that so that God can use us and we can reach out to the broader community and and help others. And so uh, trying times like ours really require it requires an anti-fragile, strong kind of faith. And uh, the church can't be a spiritual greenhouse. It can't be a place that where, where things just grow in an, in an artificial environment. It has to be where we kind of have the kind of the, the faith that like Joe has, like it has to be kind of a spiritual boot camp. And uh, we've got to embrace, embrace the pressure, embrace the stress, embrace the hard things that God lets us go through. Because actually, when I think about my life, it's, it's like they're not enjoyable but if I think about when have I grown most in my faith, it's been through it's been through the struggles and the hard times more than it's been through uh, the easy mountaintop kind of kind of times. And so, so we have to like like the scriptures that I read uh, earlier. We have to joyfully uh, face stress and struggles as opportunities to grow. And our growth will not only be good for us; it will be good for the whole community. It'll be good for like all the people that we're reaching out to as as well.